from Mrs. Danvers, I wish to see her immediately. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Taylor Francis, who is a co-founder at Watershed. Welcome to the show today. Scott, so excited to be here. All right. So you worked at uh, Stripe that processes online payments for several years. I wonder if you could tell us about that experience and how some of the learnings at that company prepared you for what you're doing today. Yeah. So I was lucky to join Stripe back in 2014. It was about 100 people Um, On the outset, it looked like a payments company, but in reality, Stripe is on a much bigger mission to build commerce infrastructure to enable the online economy to grow. Um, I spent most of my time there working on a product called Stripe Atlas, which actually is a set of tools that help founders start companies and kind of incorporate companies, open bank accounts, get their businesses off the ground. Um, You know, I think a part of my background that's actually relevant to the mission at Watershed goes back before Stripe. Um, mm-hmm. So Christian, Avi, and I, who co-founded Watershed, all worked together at Stripe, but we all had this passion for climate that went back before we joined Stripe. For me, that was when I saw the Inconvenient Truth movie back in 2006 and walked out of that movie theater kind of riled up and wanting to do something to have an impact on climate change. And I went home and tried to guess Al Gore's email address and got an email back from his assistant from info at algor.com saying, we're actually training a couple hundred people to give the Inconvenient Truth slideshow in their communities. And I spent all of high school giving talks at libraries and assemblies and schools um, about climate and about this emergency that we're in. And I think our kind of impetus in starting Watershed was to bring those two threads together of climate is an emergency that needs action. And as we learned at Stripe, businesses have the leverage on climate. And if you can build a set of software tools that enable businesses to do things, that's a way to have a lot of impact in the world. I think it's fantastic. And um, what I would say is uh, on Stripe side, this notion of building infrastructure is actually really meaningful uh, and valuable. And I think um, the value of the data uh, ultimately is the key, right? So but in order to actually pull out that data, where do you source that data? How do you actually you know, integrate that data, transform that data, interpret that data, and present that data? And really, Watershed is really all about data, isn't it? Um, and then going back to your early experience uh, in your youth, uh, it's, it's wonderful to see that you can now combine and intersect your passion and your value system with business. And it really, from a timing perspective, it can't be better. I think the last few years has been very much about awareness and kind of the tipping point to where we are today around ESG and climate change. But now we got to get into the hard work, which is yep. the carbon accounting and actual behavioral changes and real system processes changes, again, going back to infrastructure. So let's totally. start with uh, Watershed. What is it and what are you guys, what are you guys doing around carbon ca- accounting? Watershed is a software platform to help companies get to zero carbon. Our mission is to build the tools that enable a business to basically do a few things, measure their carbon emissions so they know where they're at today, plan out different ways to reduce emissions, execute on that plan by buying clean power, by engaging their suppliers, by redesigning their product, actually remove carbon from the atmosphere for whatever emissions remain, and then report on that progress externally so that investors, regulators, employees, customers can hold them accountable. But at the end of the day, our thesis here is that it's not enough for companies to just report their carbon. It's not enough to just kind of publish your graph. Companies actually need to bend that graph. We need to enable businesses to 
take concrete action that prevents carbon from going into the atmosphere. I think that's part of what differentiates us from other players in this space is that carbon accounting is not the end goal for us. It's a tool and it's a tool in the direction of companies buying clean power, shifting materials, changing suppliers, taking like concrete actions that result in less carbon in the atmosphere. So that's, that's the thing we work back from in every part of our product operations and business. Well, there was an interesting article that came out on Nature, and it's from University of Oxford in collaboration with another research lab. And it's this notion that um, really in order for us to really make an impact and try to get our overall climate temperature to 1.5 or less, it's going to require for not only carbon accounting, but effectively for the polluters to have to pay. Mm -hmm. uh, without getting into all the depth of that, um, in effect, I wonder if your business model acts like a data publisher, like an S&P 500 or Bloomberg, that then provides the data for decision makers, invest for investment purposes, and even compliance and enforcement. Totally. Our thought is, you know, at the end of the day, climate is a, it's a data problem. It's a math problem. Every choice that a business makes has carbon impact. What transportation to use, what supplier to use, what power source to use. And the problem is that today, those decision makers don't have access to the data on the carbon trade-offs of their choices. You know, if you're a procurement lead and you're choosing between cloud providers, there's a huge difference between whether or not you use an AWS region in Oregon or in Ohio. But generally, the person making that choice doesn't have access to that data. So yes, a huge part of our thesis is Let's put the data on trade-offs in the hands of decision makers at the moment those decisions are getting made. And we're working with companies like Airbnb that's making decisions about their host platform, DoorDash that's making decisions about delivery and logistics and vehicles, Sweetgreen that's making choices about what goes on the menu and who they source ingredients from, Stripe and Shopify and ServiceNow that are making decisions about tech infrastructure that kind of underlies the internet. Um, Everlane that's making decisions about materials and new um, apparel products. And so all of these companies are trying to embed carbon data into the decisions they make every day. And if it works out, I mean, if, it, if, our, if our bet pays off, it's going to have a real impact in bending that carbon curve to zero. Now, what's interesting from an angle is um, this focus around suppliers. So whether yeah. it's, you know, build materials and the, and the suppliers that goes into the raw materials to the vendors that's involved in the value add processes to those that are providing logistics and supply chain and so forth and infrastructure. Uh, what about the actual accountability for the organization itself in terms of mm -hmm. what they're doing relative to the third parties? You know, I think both are really important. And for us, the focus is follow the numbers. You know, when a company uses watershed, you cannot hide from the numbers about where your carbon comes from. And for some companies, the carbon is coming from their own operations, from their data centers, from electricity they're buying. And the whole focus in those cases is buy clean power, shift from dirty power to clean power, use less electricity, get rid of natural gas, electrify everything. Um, and then for other companies, most of the impact is in the supply chain. And the only way you can bend that number to zero is if you use the power of the purse and basically say to suppliers, we're going to use carbon as a filter on our decisions about what suppliers to work with. So I think both are really important. The challenge in the past has been that a bunch of companies have basically declared themselves carbon neutral because they spent 50 or 100 or 200K to buy clean power offsets for their office emissions when maybe that's only 5% or 10% of their overall carbon footprint. And so I think we're seeing this huge shift from a world that was like, let me just look inside my four walls and kind of call it a day um, to a world that's all about, let me look at my impact holistically and take responsibility for actually driving all of those emissions to zero, whether I'm the direct controller of it or not. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to bring it up myself is this notion of pay to pollute, right? So if there's enough you know, carbon credits or some, some offset that they've purchased or, or invested, 
that's that's sufficient when in fact that's not far from it it's not making yes. any difference totally. one of the areas that i want to explore a little bit is around first definition but also standardization mm. uh, you know i think though i know you guys are compliant with ghg protocol and many yep. other uh you know disclosure obligations the, the issue is how what are people reporting how is it being recorded and are the metrics truly um comparable in the sense of, you know, uh, metrics they can compare across sectors or within industries, for example, um, are we really fooling ourselves thinking that we're measuring when in fact, what we're measuring is really kind of nebulous and very subjective. You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in their area of sustainability and human survival on Earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. It's such a good question. It's one we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, I think there's good news and bad news here. The good news is the level of rigor and seriousness and standardization in this space is increasing rapidly. We work with customers who expect the same rigor from their carbon data that they expect from their financial data. And that comes with audits and verification and really peering into the last decimal points of every piece of their carbon footprint. That's, that's good news. And it's also manifesting in the emergence of kind of an acronym soup of um, standards um, where actually there's a meme out there that there's too many standards and there's a divergence. I actually think there's convergence around the GHG protocol as the set of accounting rules, um, TCFD as the guidance on how you publish those rules externally, a thing called science-based targets as the standard for what counts as a good climate target. So we're getting some convergence. The space is maturing and people are beginning to be on the same page about the rules of the road of what you count and how. That's the good news. The bad news is that the whole point of measurement is to enable the right action. And the status quo in carbon accounting maybe enables you to publish a really detailed PDF that has all the right acronyms and all the right seals on it, but it does not enable companies to actually make the right choices. I'll give you an example. For most companies, most of their carbon comes from scope three. It comes from the stuff they're buying from other businesses. The standard approach to measuring those emissions is to look at how many dollars did you spend in a certain category and multiply it by what the EPA said in 2010 was the carbon per dollar in that category. That's actually pretty good for getting a rough ballpark on your carbon footprint, but it does not at all enable you to take the right action because in that world, the only thing you can do to reduce those emissions is to buy less stuff, which I'm sure companies would love to do, but you know, just saying it doesn't make it so. What we actually want companies to do is to redesign their products, change materials, change suppliers, and the status quo doesn't enable that. So a lot of the things that we spend time on are how can we get the data, how can we upgrade the quality of carbon accounting and data so that it enables the right action so that you know the carbon footprint of a specific company, of a specific supplier, of a specific product, um, and you can make choices based on that. That's hard. Um, it's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of detail to get that right. It's part of what we're trying to bring to bear in this space. Yeah, I think you make some excellent points. Uh, let's talk a little bit about regulation. Yeah. You know, I think all of these are great, and I, I think I think there are there is genuine willingness on the part of many corporations, uh, partly because it's being driven by shareholders at this point. Yep. However, it's still very much a voluntary basis, and, yep. and, and certainly I know IFC and World Bank are working to bring on the, the institutional uh, investors and asset holders onto this as well. Um, but it's not until you have regulation and particularly some form of stick uh, where, yes. you know, people are going to really start to have adherence and, and really take compliance very seriously. And that all of this uh, carbon accounting is going to be right up there in terms of the kinds of things that uh, investors look at when they're evaluating a publicly traded company or even a private company, for instance. So yeah. what is the role of regulation and what's too much and what's too little? Totally. 
on this space, I think the core idea, and it's gone from being a radical idea to a mainstream idea, is that carbon risk is investor risk is financial risk. And if you're an investor, you expect to have full transparency on all the risks that could affect the quality of your investment. And the biggest economic force of the next decade is decarbonization. The second biggest force, well, I guess the two biggest forces of the next decade are the impact of climate change on businesses and the impact of decarbonization on the choices that every company makes. And so investors need to know. Um, and I think that's what's powering this whole shift right now. Where does that show up in regulation? I think we're going to see what's currently being enacted in the UK and Europe become standard practice around the world, which is large companies, both public and private, are expected to report on carbon at least once a year with the same rigor in which they report on their financial data. And that ship has sailed in the UK. It, sh- it sailed in Europe. The SEC is making proposals in the- along those lines in the US by the end of the year. But honestly, investors aren't waiting for the SEC to stand up on this. I think when we talk to CFOs, when we talk to heads of investor relations, the ship has really sailed. The train has left the station on carbon data is a standard part of doing business for large companies. And I think that'll be a really powerful force. Um, It's kind of a policy that basically doesn't cost anything or costs a, a marginal amount, but brings this enormous power of daylight and transparency and data to all the decision makers who have leverage over carbon. Um, the other thing I'll say on regulation is I think we do need gut, we do need companies to do more to stand up on climate legislation writ large, which isn't just about SEC disclosure requirements. It's about the Build Back Better bill in Congress today. It's about what happens to clean energy requirements um, in uh, the uh, you know, in the reconciliation bill, it's about what happens to the infrastructure bill. It's about how does the U.S. show up at COP in the next few weeks. Um, there's been a lot of companies that have been walking the walk in their own operations on climate, but have been kind of deafeningly silent on the most important climate legislation of the decade. So I think another thing for us to realize is that yes, companies can get a lot done. And also policy is a key lever and businesses should be using their voice on that as well. Great discussion. L- love it. Um, one of the things that I'm struggling uh, is this notion of, um, you know, developed nation versus developing and least developed. Mm-hmm. So in other words, let's say that we end up embracing the UK and EU standards and regulation, regulation framework within the North America and other places. But what's going to happen is there are going to be either developing or least developed countries that cannot comply or choose not to comply, whether it's the likes of Indonesia, parts of Africa, you name it. Um, But yet, you know, we live in one planet and what people do in Africa, Indonesia, Southeast Asia affects all of us because it goes into the atmosphere. It goes into the ocean, to the land. Um, So how do we address this both kind of highly correlated income inequality, but this disparity between the haves, haves not, uh, and then the compliance and the rigor and the capital that's required to actually do this right? Yeah. It's a good question. I'll tell you the thing that we see is that um, carbon supply chains stretch across the country. And when you look at a company like Apple, most of its carbon is actually in China and Taiwan from electronic suppliers. Um, Ditto when we work with companies in the apparel space, a lot of their carbon is showing up on kind of the US carbon balance sheet, but it's actually carbon imported by an apparel company in the US from suppliers in Southeast Asia. Um, I think that actually creates a lot of potential because if companies have pressure to take responsibility for their entire carbon supply chain, they can bring capital and resources and expertise to bear on decarbonizing some of these lesser developed countries because they are part of that company's carbon supply chain. Um, The other thought I have here is we also need to own up to the fact that if you look at where the cumulative carbon in the atmosphere has come from, it's come from the developed world. It's come from the US and Europe. China, in a 
rapidly increasing way over the last couple of decades, but this is a cumulative problem and the US has been the biggest driver. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know that it's the poorest people in the world who are going to pay the biggest price who are on the front lines of rising seas and um, food insecurity and you know, these climate impacts that are not hitting in the future, but hitting today. I think we as a developed world have fallen woefully short on delivering there, on delivering on capital to support um, least developed countries to decarbonize on capital to support them to deal with climate impacts. We just, we can't forget who caused this problem and who's paying the price. And there's a real justice issue there. Yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. And certainly as much as I think, uh, you know, the likes of Walmart, Target and uh, large suppliers and those that procure it, uh, and, and they certainly do invest into the supply chain within these markets like East Asia and Southeast Asia as an example, but to really um, make infrastructure level changes, it, it's very, very difficult, especially in sectors like, let's say, retail or clothing, where the margins are so razor thin. You know, it, it really takes uh, industry level, consortium level, yes, to to, to make a make make a change. Otherwise, uh, any one company, it's going to be a little bit Can't too much. Flex there. it on their own, totally. Let's come back to your company because you guys are hitting some key milestones in terms of what you guys are measuring, uh, I think, yep. in terms of metric tons. And also, you guys have been backed by the likes of John Doerr, Lauren, Lauren Paul Jaws, Michael Moritz, and, and many others. What, what's, what's happening with your company? Don't forget to visit astroprickins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Damian Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroperkins.com and click on events. We are seeing what I think everyone is seeing, which is not a moment too soon. The rush to decarbonize is on. And every company, every investor feels that, and they feel that with tremendous urgency. And it's good news because we have very, very little time to decarbonize until we're out of time. How it's showing up for us is kind of rapid growth on the customer side. And so we're working with a whole bunch of leading companies in the US, Canada, Europe, around the world. Um, we're actually at a point now where the watershed customer base manages more than 10 million tons of CO2 per year, more than triple the carbon footprint of the entire city of San Francisco. We're just getting started. We've set a goal of getting to watershed customers reducing or removing 500 million tons of CO2 per year, which would be 1% of the world's emissions. So we have a long way to go, but it's already pretty exciting that we have kind of several cities worth of carbon leverage on the watershed platform. And you know, for us, this is all about moving fast and building the company for the long haul. And that's what's guided our decisions about the investors we work with, the customers we work with. Um, we've got a lot of work to do and we have very little time to get it done. Well, it's, uh, it's very exciting. And again, I think uh, going back to what I said early on is the timing can be better. You know, I think it, we really needed it even sooner, but Everybody else finally getting on board and getting to a point where they're ready to do this is just perfect. So from a timing and execution, it's beautiful for you guys. But I wonder, um, you know, carbon accounting is an area where we anticipate there's going to get fairly saturated pretty soon. In other words, there's going to be a lot of new entrants. What's your strategy in terms of not just being one of the early leaders in this space, but also staying, um, you know, staying and, and capturing and retaining market share? I think we're trying to play a different game. We're not in this to play the carbon accounting game. We are in this to be a platform that enables decarbonization, to enable the organizations on the front lines of climate change to make different choices. And that's hard. If it weren't hard, it would have happened already. That's, you know, that's why we've got our work cut out as a society over whether or not decarbonization is going to happen over the next decade. Um, so that's where we're spending our time. It's on enabling market access to clean power and carbon removal. It's on enabling companies to flex their muscle with their supply chain um, because publishing the graph doesn't get it done. We got to have companies actually bend the graph. 
I guess one thought I'll, I'll also share on the timing point. We certainly feel as entrepreneurs, a lot of excitement about this market moment and the timing right now. I think as climate advocates, we feel um, a deep sense of urgency because the sort of inescapable fact of climate change in 2021 is that we are running out of time. And the way I think about this is if you think of the 2020s as the decade where we have to cut carbon in half, every month of this decade is 1% of the time we have left. Every day is actually 2.7 basis points of the time we have left. It adds up. A decade goes by in an instant. Um, so Yes, it's exciting. The market's exploding, but mostly we all have to move a lot faster to bend the carbon graph to zero. What do you say to those um, where they say, well, it's too late. If you look at all the studies, uh, no matter what we do, how aggressive we are, you know, the, the average rise in temperature is going to still hit whatever 1.5 degrees or whatever it is, global index. There's nothing we can do to slow it down or reverse it. How would you respond to that? I think we're in a mode where hopefully this is happening slowly and then all at once. And my hope is that we're in the moment where the bit is flipping from slowly to all at once. And you know, when I first started working on this in 2006, there were really hard science problems that stood between the world and decarbonization. And there still are. There's a lot we got to figure out and solve. The thing that's changed is that we now live in a world with solar and wind cheaper than coal and natural gas. We live in a world where electric vehicles are gonna take over. It's just a question of when. We're kind of entering the deployment phase of the climate solution. And if we've learned one thing from the internet, if we've learned one thing from the growth of technology over the last few years, it's that deployment can happen really fast um, when you get on a, set of, on a set of curves. And I think we're starting to get on those curves right now. So. We should move with urgency. I also think we can move with some optimism um, on, on making this happen. Now, I know Watershed doesn't necessarily focus on carbon capture or carbon sequestration per se, but it's one thing to reduce, uh, get to a point of carbon neutral, let's say, but it, to get to negative, meaning actually reducing carbon, any, any, any opinions or thoughts? Carbon removal is really important. Um, it's something we work with Stripe and Shopify and many of our customers on funding next generation permanent advanced carbon removal that actually take carbon out of the atmosphere. It's a key part of the solution. Great. So on that note, I have been joined by Taylor Francis, who is a co-founder of Watershed. Thank you for Thank joining you. today. Thank you, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.